doctors of Reddit, what's the biggest case of faking it you've ever seen? Years ago, I had a patient who had been rear-ended in an auto accident a few weeks before I saw her. She had a history of lupus. She was decked out in the usual I'm crippled paraphernalia, crutches, neck brace, elbow braces, wrist braces, knee braces, and could barely walk. I saw her a couple of times and she showed no improvement. One Saturday, I was on call but had to take a back streets route to the hospital because of an event taking place on the main thoroughfare. I apparently drove through her neighborhood because wonders behold, there she was wearing old lady spandex power walking down the sidewalk, holding weights in both hands. I did not call out to her. Next week, she was back in clinic with her I'm crippled get up on again. Hmm. A few weeks later, I got the subpoena for the deposition and it all became clear. What did you do at that point? We need part two of this story. I could not have sworn under oath that I had absolutely positively identified that woman power walking. I know it was her. I later confirmed she lived in that area. She and her attorney could have argued that it was her sister or daughter or cousin or whatever. So I just honestly answered all the questions during the deposition. Many I could not answer because I did not see her immediately after the accident. I could, however, honestly say that I thought she had a good prognosis and was likely to recover fully. By the way, it is not unusual for patients seeking compensation through some legal process to exaggerate the degree of their injuries. Everybody involved in the process understands this. It is, however, incumbent upon the patient to maintain their act in a believable fashion. Not a doctor, but I was in the ER one night and there was a seeking drug addict who literally only acted in pain when there was staff around. You ever see those videos where the little kid is fine and then they spot the parent and then ball then immediately stop and be fine when the parent is out of view? Exactly like that. Sat fine, no movements or wincing or noises. Then wailing when a nurse was in the same vicinity. Then back to fine when they left. A few weeks ago, I had a vulvar biopsy. I was petrified of this procedure and I didn't know how to ask the doctor if I'll be given pain meds because of people like this. There is no way to even frame the question without sounding like a drug seeker. I ended up not needing anything at all, but still, figure it's a legit question, but you can't ask it. Fourth year medical student. On my ER rotation and a trauma came in from a woman that they had been arrested. During the drive, the patient banged her head four times against the window of the police car and then went unresponsive. She came to us with a bruise over her forehead and unresponsive. We all smelled BS, but the patient was a great actor, didn't even flinch during the digital rectal exam, which is standard for all patients that come in through the trauma bay. Though some of the nurses said that they caught her peeking at us when we would leave the room, we ended up getting a CT scan, which was normal and was even considering intubating her to secure her airway when our attending finally walked over to her opened her eyelids and held them open while telling her to wake up. Finally, she started fighting to close her eyes and the jig was up. The doctor called her out and she proceeded to start screaming at us. She was much more pleasant when she was pretending to have a brain injury. Why is a digital rectal exam standard for all trauma patients? Assessing for rectal tone can give insight into spinal cord neurological injuries. Presence of blood in the rectum could indicate GI pelvic trauma. Truthfully, recent studies have debated its usefulness and reliability, especially given the potential for making a traumatic situation more traumatic for a patient. But my institution still does it. Not a doctor, but nurse. I once read a specialist's consultation report, and at the end of the report, the actual diagnosis given was fictitious ailment. Oh, dang. Is a fictitious ailment something that can be noted in their medical records? There's actually a psychiatric diagnosis of factitious disorder, factitious with an A, which is a fake illness for primary gain. In example, the patient likes being in the sick role. This is contrasted with malingering, which is for secondary gain like missing school, work, lawsuit settlements, etc. Audiologist, hearing specialist, have worked in private sector with legal claims and with the VA handling veterans' claims of hearing loss. With those two populations, having people faking hearing loss is pretty common. Now, as a professional, for me the hearing test starts when I call the person's name from the waiting room. In a normal voice, I call them. If they answer, I already know that they're normal, no worse than mild loss. This was the case with this guy. He answered and came in. We had a normal conversation. So, case history over. Time to test. 
I gave the instructions over the headphones at a reasonable 50 decibels. Raise your hand when you hear the tone. 50 decibel tone should be easy and clear. But he doesn't raise his hand. I go up and up and up. Finally, I'm putting a 100 decibel tone in his ear. He's flinching from pain. It's so loud, but he doesn't raise his hand to indicate he's heard the tone, even with the instruction. I immediately know what I'm dealing with. I have taught entire classes on how to spot and try to get estimated true results from people lying to fake it. Long story short, I wrote a damning report outlining all his inconsistencies and faking behaviors. The thing that made this one so memorable is that we had such a pleasant conversation before. He was a fire chief. I have firefighters in my family. It was one of those where you think if it wasn't for professional patient appropriate distance, we could hang and be friends. But then, this guy was determined to get a disability rating, and it just pissed me off. I have other stories in case anyone is interested, but it's likely this comment gets buried. Safety professional. We had guys claim work-related hearing would be seen on the gun range on the weekends with no protection. TBF, if you're deaf, I guess you don't need ear protection. Posted this before, but male patient, 18 years old, rolled in unconscious. Mom says he's been like that for the past four hours. Go to check his lungs when I hear something interesting. I place the stethoscope near his mouth and hear him breathe in normally, but then breathe out by saying, breathe. No joke. Male patient, 21 years old, admitted with inability to speak for the last two hours and respiratory distress. Lungs, clear, but we hook him up to oxygen for a few minutes. After he's taken off, his father comes running and drags me over saying his son's tongue refuses to go back in after receiving the oxygen. I look at the kid and he's seriously just lying there with his tongue poking out like a child. I tell them to push it back in. A few hours later, the dad tells me the boy is convulsing. I go to see without making my presence known, and he's lying there just fine. The moment I ask the mom how he's doing, he starts convulsing. Think of an odd version of the worm, but on his back. Female patient, 16 years old, admitted with complaints of recurrent seizures and frothing from the mouth. I look at her and she's literally blowing spit bubbles. I check her reflexes, everything is intact. The moment I turn away to check on another patient, she suddenly becomes rigid and the spitting intensifies. Male patient, 30 years old, unconscious and completely unresponsive for 6 hours. This guy was totally dedicated to his act. I initially approached it as a stroke, but when the blood pressure, ECG, reflexes, pupils, etc. all are normal, I started checking pain sensation. He slowly began to open his eyes and groan as I asked him to tell me his name. But the moment his Achilles tendon was pressed, he suddenly sat up, stated his name, and declared himself cured. Female patient, 17 years old, complained of respiratory distress and convulsions. Everything's normal on admission, and she's conscious but refuses to eat. Parents are worried out of their minds, and every few minutes, she has a fit where she would just basically shake from side to side. She let slip to a nurse that she didn't want to go to school that week, so she was faking an illness. Since she was refusing to eat, the attending wrote up an order for a nasogastric tube, which was inserted and then removed by her in a matter of minutes. What was going on with the first kid? He was verbally coaching himself through breathing. My only guess is that he was high, off his bicky, and breathing manually because he was afraid he'd forget to breathe and would die. Not me, but know an army doctor who prescribed everyone with cold-like symptoms or sore legs to stay in bed for the whole day. The next day, half as many people with symptoms showed up. I knew a guy in my training unit who had been given bed rest orders by the doc after getting some dental done. Wisdom teeth extraction if I remember correctly. They were excited for the first day, but by day three, they were begging to be taken off bed rest out of boredom. When I was a kid, I learned I could fake sick and get out of school. So one to two days a week, I would get a migraine and hold my head and complain I would get to go home. Eventually, my parents took me to a neurologist who said, maybe you just don't let him eat chocolate and sugar. I admitted to faking and was grounded for a long time. I grew up the opposite way. I would get three to four migraines a week, but everyone thought I was faking it because most days I seemed fine, just because I was learning how to deal with them and try to act normal. 
It wasn't until eight years after they started that I went to a neurologist who said I had chronic migraines, which I dealt with unmedicated for 16 years. Now I'm on medication, I feel like my childhood was wasted. I had three migraines a week at one point, aged around eight, nine, and the GP told my parents I just wanted time off, school, and gymnastics. Age 12, I had cranial decompression surgery just over two weeks after diagnosis for a hindbrain hernia. Definitely feel you on the trying to act normal part. I saw father and his son wink when I was turning to face them again when I was done writing a note to stay home from school. That's pretty much it. Faking it is a hard call to make in general. I used to work as an EEG tech and we had a patient come in at the end of the day from an A&E. To get the results quicker, we also had the consultant neurologist with us to formally assess the study. This woman was faking it and was really bad at it too. Still, we had to go through the motions. And she wasn't faking it. She was definitely having epileptic activity. Fool the veteran neurologist, a 25-year veteran EEG tech, and a couple of us other techs with only a few years under our belts. When I was about 9, I told my mom I had a stomach ache so I could stay home from school. I did it so much she got worried and I got an ultrasound. The doctors found my left kidney down in my pelvis. My stomach pains ended after that. ER patient registers with chief complaint of dental pain. Allergies to every known NSAID. Yes, I know this can actually be genuine such as with AERD. This is a small rural hospital. So I happened to see this guy go across the hall to the lounge and help himself to a big mug of hot black hospitality quality coffee and proceed to drink it in the waiting area. On asking about the dental pain, he reports that the pain is severe and worsened by drinking cold or hot liquids. His head and neck exam are non-acute and he is discharged to home with instructions for supportive care including ice packs and follow-up with his dentist ASAP. His dissatisfaction is loud and salty. As someone who's experienced dental pain, the hot coffee part makes my mouth hurt. Hot drinks never bothered my teeth much, but I couldn't drink ice water for about 15 years. When I was a kid, I would plan my sick days way ahead of time. Had an old thermos that I would pour leftover milk, meat, whatever, leave it on the windowsill in my bedroom, just letting it fester for a month. Of course, the thermos was closed, so no smells escaped. I set an alarm in the middle of the night, dumped the contents of the thermos on my rug, and ran in to tell my dad I was throwing up and so sick. However, this thermos monstrosity filled the entire condo up with horrible smells and both me and my dad ended up puking into the tub at the same time every time we tried to clean up the rug. He had to take the day off work too. Needless to say, I never pulled that again. I was worried you were going to drink it in order to make yourself sick. Thank goodness that is not what happened. I'm not that big of a monster, just a normal gremlin. My mom's an ER nurse and she said, Once, some crazy lady came in and complained that she had the whooping cough. And whenever she coughed, she followed it with a loud whoop. She's doing it wrong. That's a coughing whoop. Exactly. The right way is to whoop before you cough. Whoop cough. Obligatory, not a doctor. I was an EMT and had a frequent flyer who rotated through various chief complaints, one which was complete blindness, emphasis on complete. We did our duty of course, got him on board, took vitals, BLS'd him to the nearest hospital, but we occasionally had a bit of fun with him. One of the blindness calls, we noted that he walked a rather narrow and windy path from his trailer to the rig without any issue. Once on board the rig, when asked for his insurance card, he fingered through his wallet and fetched it from among a mass of cards without issue. When asked direct questions, he met our gaze and followed it when our heads moved. When I pointed all this out to him, his only response was to quickly look at something over my shoulder and stammer through, No, I'm blind. Okay, our mistake then. Off we go. Well, in all fairness, I can pick out individual cards from the vast accumulation of stuff in my wallet without looking. Simply because I always put things in the same place all the time, and I know how it all feels. Folds, peeling plastic and such, 